Good morning, and uh, I would first of all like to thank Elliot, the other symposium organizers, and the overall workshop organizers for the invitation to come. Um, I'm a zooplankton guy. I work fairly low in the food web, and uh, this is a new community for me, apart from some present and former students I see in the audience. Um, and, and I see many points of intersection of common research interests here. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here. It's been, yesterday was illuminating for me. Um, I'm also here in my capacity as the lead PI for the California Current Ecosystem LTER site. This, I can use this as a pointer. Long-term ecological research. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to do justice to this program, but um, the LTER program, situated in the southern sector of the California Current, also offers many opportunities for collaborative, interactive work. Um, I'll have to leave it at that. Now, uh, I'll with this one. The climate in the Californian current is changing. There's no question of that. And this is part of, um, of larger ocean changes. The challenge is that it's changing on multiple time scales simultaneously. And this is reflected in this um, simple graph that we see right here of temperature anomalies that's uh, from taken from the Scripps Pier over 60 years, over a 60 year time, um, time interval. And on this 60 year time scale, um, the secular warming trend is discernible, uh, fairly, fairly clearly discernible. But note that this is only about a one to a one and a half degree Celsius change from the mean here to the mean here over 60 years. Now that change, um, that secular change, is confounded by the very uh, strong interannual scale perturbations in the system and multi-decadal scale perturbations in the system. I parse things a little differently than you do on here. Um, for example, consider the magnitude of that, change, that warming over 60 years versus this transition from the strong Nino conditions of 98 to the very strong La Nina conditions of 99. This is a three degree Celsius drop over a year in contrast to the about 1.5 degree increase over 60 years. In addition to this, inter the very strong interannual forcing that we have in the California current, there is the multi-decadal scale forcing, uh, including <coughs> predominantly the PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, also the NPGO, North Pacific Gyro Oscillation. And I'll have to just um, sort of skip over those, but suffice it to say that um, you can see a, a, about two and a half cool decades at the beginning of this record um, followed by an abrupt change to about two uh, relatively warmer decades here. And this is part of the multi-decadal signal, which of course can be confounded again by these interannual changes. Now, what do the, um, oops, we want to go forward, not back. What um, do the zooplankton tell us, and how does this affect the zooplankton? There are actually two sides. Um, to what extent do these climate signals affect the zooplankton? which have, has implications for many of your consumers. And conversely, how can we use the zooplankton as uh, tools to, to understand these scales of forcing? Now, this is one species of krill, a time series of abundance from the Kalkaki sampling in the southern sector of the California current. Um, Euphausia pacifica, the dominant species of Euphausia uh, in the CCS. And you see that, and these are anomalies on a log scale, um, and you see that there's no clear evidence of a secular trend, either up or down. Perhaps a little you know, higher abundance in more recent years, but not a statistically significant trend. However, there are very strong year-to-year -year differences in this species of krill. And um, much, but not all, of this uh, signal is affected by the El Nino response. The El Nino phase of the ENSO cycle, you see that the, the big drip dips downward are associated um, with the uh, El Nino phase. And by the way, this, since it's, this is on a log scale, from minus one to plus one up here represents a 100-fold change in abundance. These are very substantial. Um, however, I'm, um, forgive me, I think I'll switch to this one. Um, this, this is another species of uh, krill, Nictiphany simplex, um, which is from the same plankton sample, sampled in exactly the same part of the ocean, which shows a markedly different um, time series. Well, there is interannual variability in this record, certainly. The dominant signal is the decadal signal, with this period from the late 70s to the late 90s of anomalously high abundance, preceded and followed by periods of, uh, of anomalously low abundance. Once again, 
no evidence of a long-term trend, upward or downward, that's associated with that warming that we've seen um, from the Scripps Peer Record. And by the way, that exists in other records as well. And in contrast to these two species um, of, of krill, um, um, we have a, another group of zooplankton. These are salps, pelagic tunicates. If you know benthic ascidians, these are pelagic analogs of those taxa. Um, they're small filter feeding organisms uh, that, that retain very small planktonic particles. And the, there is substantial year to year variability in these cells. They're very opportunistic and they boom and bust. However, there is a long term secular decline that's occurred in these animals that's discernible on the time scale of 60 years. It wouldn't be discernible on a time scale of uh, 20 or 30 years, however. All of these organisms coexist in the same part of the ocean from the same plankton samples. We are not able to tease out these signals unless we analyze the species of the zooplankton present. Um, uh, if we were to take a composite of all taxa, in fact, we've done that, not only the, the krill and the salps, but also copepods, epidicularians, etc., and the total carbon biomass, um, we see uh, for both Southern California on the left and Central California on the right, for which we have um, a, a more abbreviated time series, um, you see no, uh, no evidence of the multi-decadal response that we saw with the Tiffany simplex, no evidence of the secular decline that we saw with the salps. So the point here is that we can't look at total aggregated um, carbon biomass of the zooplankton is some indicator of prey availability to, um, to other consumers. You have to tease out and look at the components of the assemblage. That's point number one. Point number two concerns the importance of um, spatial gradients in the system. And I realize that the fishing community has known about this for a long time, in fact lives and works from it. Um, some of us in the scientific community are latecomers to this issue. This, this has been facilitated um, by uh, our awareness, my awareness, I should not, I'll speak of my awareness, by some of the technologies we have available, where the upper panel here, uh, the, uh, the upper surfaces on both panels are satellite images, which we've had for quite some time, but the vertical <coughs> face of those panels are as a result, excuse me, of the robotic ocean gliders, in this case the spray ocean gliders that we operate at Scripps, that, um, developed by my colleague Russ Davis. So we're able to get into the interior of the ocean, resolve horizontal spatial gradients much better than we could before, not relying solely on the surface phenomena. But you can see um, uh, these very strong gradients uh, from the low chlorophyll to the high chlorophyll, this anticyclonic eddy, that cyclonic eddy out here. And the question is, what consequences does this have for the zooplankton and the consumers um, that utilize them? Well, um, this is uh, now a section from inshore to offshore from the spray gliders. Um, this is off-point conception, Cal Coffee Line 80, if you're familiar. We're going from the surface to 500 meters. Let's jump down here to the density section. So going from offshore to onshore, you see this dark blue to light blue transition after a very obvious density front up here. And if you jump down to chlorophyll A fluorescence, which is a proxy measure of phytoplankton biomass, there's a market change in the inferred biomass of phytoplankton, not only a change in the concentration, but also on the offshore side of the front is subduction and uh, the development of the, the sort of typical deep chlorophyll maximum. Abrupt gradient in both um, prey availability and also vertical distribution. And then most, perhaps most interestingly, at least to me, is the bottom panel. I always tell students never put the important things on the bottom, but here I've done it. Um, and, uh, uh, and this work is, by the way, the work of the grad student, Scripps Jeffrey Powell. Um, this is an acoustic backscatter at 750 kilohertz. This is organisms nominally about 1.5 to 2 millimeters and larger. Um, and you see that, that there is a very abrupt uh, change, not only in the inferred biomass of the zooplankton at this one, but also the vertical distribution. The dial vertical migration behavior from night, day, night, day has a different amplitude offshore the front from onshore the front. So, um, so the gliders have been useful tools, and we have um, begun looking into the ocean um, using direct sampling because there are distinct advantages there, too. Uh, this is an example of one of the fronts that, uh, that we've analyzed. 
Um, this is sea surface temperature, and now focusing on this blue box here, you see the light blue to green transition, the color front. This is uh, SST front, and the ocean color front is over here on the right, it's enlarged. And I'm going to take you across this section where the little pink dots are from uh, south to north going here, sampling um, into the ocean environment across this front. And here, um, so this is left is to the south, and right is to the north of the front. Um, this shows the uh, photosynthetic efficiency, quantum yield. This is just how efficiently the phytoplankton utilize light energy in photosynthesis. And at least at the chlorophyll max, it's maximal here. There's a, a bullseye of a maximal diatom biomass at this point, a, a, a bullseye of a maximal uh, bacterial production at this front. So clear features of enhancement, but then some types of phytoplankton, these small picoplankton, prochlorococcus, um, is predominantly south of the front, and synecococcus, another picoplankton, uh, north of the front. So they're partitions as well as enhancements. And this is a, a case, um, uh, the zooplankton, um, in, uh, these are the, uh, uh, at the location of the front here, and you see copepods, appendicularians, krill, and eggs are all enhanced at the front relative to either side. But there are also other organisms that are uh, more abundant to the south of the front than to the, to the north of the front. So these are both um, transition regions as well as re in regions of enhancement. <laughs> Uh, this is the acoustic backscatter detected by uh, Tony Koslow's group across the same front south to north using a dB differencing technique and a multi-frequency acoustic system. Um, this is the inferred backscatter from fish, and you see that the enhanced the, the peak biomass of the fish in the vicinity of the front. The fish are actually obviously smart enough to find it and use it. Now the reason I bring this up in the climate context is that um, another person in our LTR site, uh, Mani Karu, has analyzed uh, satellite imagery for the evidence of fronts in this domain. That is, the frequency of occurrence of fronts defined by a statistical criterion um, in the southern sector of the California current going back uh, maybe 15 years or so, 14, 15 years in the case of, of ocean color imagery. Uh, that's the brown curve, and you see a secular increase there. And then this surface temperature data go back much further, go back about 30 years. And we see um, in the case of both sea surface temperature fronts and uh, chlorophyll fronts, a, an increase in the, uh, in the uh, s temporal occurrence um, of these frontal features. And, uh, and this has potential cons con consequences, considerable consequences for the consumers in the system. And I think rather than recapitulate this, I'll leave it there for you to look at. Um, these are the main points that I hope you have an opportunity to think about. Thank you.